Nicole Strickland. I have been fascinated with the unknown and paranormal realms since childhood. After a profound experience with my grandmother's spirit 20 years ago, I have been on a quest to observe, study, investigate, and communicate with the afterlife and beyond. It's been an ongoing journey of exploration and discovery, one that has taught me how mortality and the spirit world are forever bonded through the veils of time. July 1st, everyone. Thursday, July 1st. Where did June go? I have no clue. Anyways, you are listening in to the Afterlife Chronicles and Beyond Radio Show now on StreamYard. We are now on StreamYard. So excited on the WLTK DB network. You know, there's bugs we have to work out and things we need to get used to. But hey, you know what? That's life. So a little bit of housekeeping before I bring in tonight's guest. So with StreamYard, the show is airing live on the WLTKDB website. You can get there, obviously, by visiting WLTKDB.com. You should be able to view it right there on the site in video form, as well as on Facebook.com slash WLTKDB and Twitch as well, dot com slash WLTKDB. And then, of course, on the Let's Talk YouTube channel. So this is great. Great exposure. Still getting used to it all. But, you know, like I said, it's a good thing. So we're really excited about it. Now that StreamYard's out of the way, uh, the station now has merch, merchandise, I should say. So just get over there on the site, click uh, the or on the main menu, the merch section, all kinds of awesome things. Tumblers. Tumblers apparently are <laughs> super popular. You know, I have a whole cupboard of them filled with or one of my cupboards up downstairs, probably has dust all over it. Always room for another tumbler. It's all good. But T-shirts, mugs, blankets, beach towels, you name it, all kinds of good stuff. The station is accepting uh, programming. So we have two slots open for anyone that wants to have their own radio show. It's a great family to be in and we're growing and expanding. And it's, it's just an honor to be with this amazing family. So enough of the housekeeping here. I do want to bring in uh, my guest, Ronald Murphy, who I interviewed, I think it was back in February, actually, uh, on Haunted Voices Radio. So now he's coming on my show, uh, author extraordinaire, paranormal researcher, and folklorist. So Ronald or, Ronald or Ron, what do you prefer? Well, whichever one you prefer, I'll answer to either one. Whatever one rolls off the tongue, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do Ron for short. Thank Sounds you so good. much for joining. Sorry about the, the technological glitches there, but that's okay. I'm not a technological guy anyways. At least we end up in the same place at the same time eventually. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, my gosh. So, anyways, thank you for joining the show. You know, like I did on Honda Voices Radio, and sometimes I like asking this question, other times I don't. But you know what? Like you said, I think you were the one that said, we're not. We don't come out of a vacuum, so it's all good. So I'm going to start and go with this. Hmm. What got you involved in paranormal research and your little bit about your background as a paranormal researcher? Well, you know, um, and I discussed this on the last show as well, too. Um, whenever I do my own uh, programs, I always ask my guests as well, too, what got you started? Because this is an odd field to get started in. It's not like, you know, we're playing tennis or we took up golf or something like that. <laughs> you know, what really led us to look and to investigate the worlds of the paranormal? Um, and I have to say that it was, you know, my mother, you know, growing up in the 70s, um, she was somebody that really allowed me free range and to explore my certain likes and dislikes. And one of the bonding experiences that we would have is watching horror programming together. You know, back in the day, they weren't slasher movies or anything. It was like uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek or, you know, the original thing, you know, things like that. So it was pretty safe by today's standards, completely safe. Um, But we were watching these kind of movies. And then we would also read together and we would listen to radio shows that had people on talking about the paranormal. And of course we had things like in search of, which is that awesome television show. Uh, oh yes. Every week. So we had this as well too. And I was lucky too, you know, I had a, uh, I have a brother that's two years younger than I am. 
uh, and he and I would go out looking for these things. Um, and the other thing that I was really lucky to have as well, too, um, I grew up in a very small town, so we were always very close-knit to everybody. So my house was only about two doors away from my uh, my cousin's house, my uh, my my aunt and my, my cousin John. Um, and he was a few years older than I am, but I really looked up to him whenever I was a kid. So he was like the guy that had all the answers. So we would go out on uh, Bigfoot investigations and talk about UFOs and everything. So it was just a really cool time to be alive. That, that's so well said. And I have to agree, you know, my family's pretty supportive of me too. I do have a couple of people that uh, are like, wait, what? Wait, you research, the, you research what? What? But most of my family is very supportive. And that's great to hear. And you live in the rural side of Pennsylvania, which is a hotbed for not only just paranormal activity, but, you know, UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings. You mentioned yeah. Bigfoot. So ha- have you ever had an actual encounter with Bigfoot that you can yeah, you re- know, recollect? Uh, I've only have anecdotal encounters with things, just enough to keep me going. Um, and I think that if you talk to any of the, the researchers out there, uh, they will all give you a very honest answer. And that usually is the case. We've come across things that we can't explain, but it's not definitive proof either. Um, you know, a couple of things that I, I've been in the woods and I've heard some sounds before that I could not um, explain. I was very close to something that had growled at me. And before I found out exactly what that was, I, I turned and ran because I'm not a stupid person. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I've heard the uh, you, the the stereotypical wood knock before, and I was walking with my kids one time um, on a summer's day after a, a, a rain, and it was very foggy, and um, uh, something uh, threw a stone at us out of the woods, a very small little stone. My son was kind of absentmindedly tossing stones into the woods, and after a while, something threw one back at him. So these are the kind of things that have happened to me. Nothing that I can say 100% that it was a cryptid or something out of an alternative universe or, or dimension, but enough to keep me going and keep me interested as well. That's interesting. I can't say my that I've ever had an actual Bigfoot sighting as well. Um, you know, the 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 stone throwing or the rock throwing is a common claim. Uh, the the weird tree structures are a common claim. I mean, it's something that I definitely am getting more into because I think it's a, a very uh, interesting uh, entity to study. What are your thoughts on? Bi- I mean, I like to ask people that ha- do uh, like cryptid research, such as yourself. I like to ask this. What are your thoughts on on because there's all these different theories on on who or what Bigfoot is? Sure. What are sure. your thoughts? Um, well, the way I go about investigating the world of the paranormal, the world of the 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 you know the stuff of nightmares, things that go bump in the night. Um, I would love for these things to be genuine and real flesh and blood creatures. Um, but the way I research, it really doesn't make a difference to me whether they are or they're not, because they're still part of our, our culture and a part of our collective unconscious. So they're worthy of study in the, in, you know, in and of themselves at that point. Right. But I, I still have to. I mean, the reason why we go out into the woods and look at things is to see if we can find evidence of such a creature, okay? So whenever you talk about things like a Bigfoot, you think about, well, are they, you know, are they flesh and blood? Are they part of the natural world around us? And I think that I get to a point whenever I say, you know, um, 50% of me says that these things are out there, okay? Um, Then there's, you know, always that that doubt that's there as well, too, because I also have to think from a, a pragmatic point of view and, you know, these things have to eat. They have to make little ones. They have to do all, all the things that animals do. And, and you would think that we'd come across many more signs. Uh, so that's really the conundrum that I'm at right now. Um, there's a lot of evidence out there saying that there's something running around in the woods. Not every person that gives an eyewitness report is a lunatic. Uh, not everybody person, not everybody is making this stuff up. There's something going on out there. And the kind of things that I've seen and have happened to me as well, too, even though I haven't seen the creature, it's still um, allowing me to believe a little bit more that there's something's going out there that we just simply cannot explain. Um, my my honest perception of the Bigfoot mythos 
is that this indeed was something that we as a human race knew about possibly in the historic times. And by historic times, I'm talking about, you know, maybe maybe 1500 years ago, there may have been remnant populations about that you know, of them out there. Um, and those, that kind of folklore and those kind of um, oral traditions were passed on to us and they became all these legends that they are today. That's that's really the way I'm looking at this now. Uh, in the same breath, I can also say I hope against hope that these things are still out there because the world is a much better place with these creatures hidden in it, you know, than it would be without them. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's because the reading that I've done, you know, you hear, oh, they're flesh and blood, uh, blood creatures. Oh, they're related to maybe uh, this is very various theories I've heard. They're related to ETs and extraterrestrials. Uh, they they come from a a different dimension. They're interdimensional, and it's hard to with all the anecdotal reports. It's it's like there's such a divide as to yeah. what Bigfoot may be, and maybe it's supposed to just like ghosts and spirits if you will maybe it's supposed to remain elusive maybe we're not supposed to understand its origins 100 percent. yeah th- i think that's a perfect synopsis nicole because that's the way i look at it as well too yeah 15 years ago if somebody would have brought to the table and said that these things are interdimensional i would have said that, that was a cop-out because you didn't want to do actual scientific research and prove the matter one way or the other you know because you can always go with that sci-fi cop-out and say oh we can't find these things because they you know they they leap over to the other side or they they, they go to another realm or whatever but you also have to say and i think that the analogy that you made about the ghost works out beautifully here um there is something about these things, some sort of commonality about all these kind of unexplained things, whether we're talking about Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or ghosts or UFOs, there's something about uh, that's connecting all these things together. There's an elusiveness, but it also seems to me, uh, the more I study it, the more that they are right beyond our reach. And possibly the reason they're right beyond our reach is because they do not exist in the same plane of existence as us. I mean, look, it, it, and that's not far-fetched. Um, I'm not a, uh, a, a molecular biologist of any means or anything, but there are things out there like quantum physics that, that, that would lend to the, to the, at least the notion that these kind of things are possible, that something can be in a form on this side and, uh, you know, take another form on another side as well, too. Um, so, you know, after 15 years, you know, after, you know, a decade and a half, I, I've come to that point where uh, because there's not been any definitive evidence that, that something has to be going on. And unless all these people that are seeing these these creatures are making it up, there has to be some place, some sort of wormhole, some sort of rabbit hole that these things are sliding down through. That makes sense. I've actually thought that too, and not just with Bigfoot, but other energies that is it possible that, you know, maybe they can exist on our plane and in multiple other planes at the same time. I don't know. You know, I sometimes when I think about this stuff, my mind goes way out. It, it but, does. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I agree with you. I think that there is this uh, almost webbing or this nexus, if you will, that's connecting all these energies. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we start to research that end a little bit more instead of separating them, we might. I'm not saying we're going to absolutely 100% find the answers, but, you know, more doors may open. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and we touched upon this a little bit last time too, Nicole. Uh, yeah. The idea that these things might be energies in and of themselves. Um, and, and that is something that we really do need to talk about. The idea that these things kind of appear and disappear and seem to be able to, to take different shapes. And they talk about Bigfoot being able to cloak and change its identity as if it's, you know, uh, you know doing some sort of fairy glamour or whatever. <laughs> um, there's something going on out there that is not simply um, flesh and blood. It seems as if it is something that is almost electronic, some sort of an intelligent elemental force that's out there. Now, if that is indeed the case. This is the reason why we don't have a body. This is the reason why we don't have a clear picture of these things. And to think that our imaginations, our mind, our entire body, if you will, is made up of electrical impulses, that these things, these creatures, if they are indeed made up of electricity, are, is, is that the reason why we see these things and some people don't? Are they able to interject themselves into our psyche and interact with us on a very subconscious level and they might not even be in front of us you know it might be something that's all within our minds 
yeah, very telepathic. Maybe it could explain too why some people connect with certain energies and others don't. Right. You know, yeah. kind of goes on the. Yep. I've been on ghost tours before uh, where people have had, um, uh, you know, very emotional experiences. And the other people that were there got none of that because it interacted with that one person in particular. Um, and I'm sure that you've had these kind of things happen to you as well, too. Absolutely. It's very, it's very subjective. The paranormal field is very subjective. Um, and um, it's based upon a personal, um, you know, experiences and perspectives and, and perceptions. And uh, we almost have to look at it on that level that that it means something it means something differently to everybody. And we, as an experiencer, defines the experience for ourselves. That's so well said. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's um, interesting, too, because uh, some of my colleagues and I, we've been talking about how there's this or there seems to be this cosmic shift, if you will. And more and more people are having experiences. More and more people are open to communicate with whether it's an earthbound or a spirit or, or a Bigfoot or an elemental. So there seems to be something out there in the cosmos that's mm. kind of bringing us more, I guess, the human living realm more together with, you know, all of these other realms. And I just find that so interesting. But yeah. then I have to quit. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, go ahead. I finished your thought because I really want to piggyback off this. I think this is great. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, too, that there may be a percentage of, and I'm not denying people's experiences, but, you know, it, the paranormal is so infused in our pop culture nowadays. So, you know, there's a lot of psychokinetic interaction and all of that. So what's the percentage of people that, let's say, they think they're having experience, but really it's not necessarily a, a true experience, but maybe like a thought projection or, or a tulpa or something like that. So yeah. I, these are things I think about, and I, I like to have discussions with people that are well, open to thinking about. Look, of, of all the investigations that I've done, I would only say that about 10% of these investigations had some sort of merit in the world of the paranormal or supernatural. Uh, most of it is somebody's projecting their own thoughts. Like you said, they watch far too many programs. Uh, they know how they are supposed to respond to these things. Um, it usually comes out that there's some sort of demon because that's, you know, that's the, the thing that's in, uh, in style right now. And, um, they go through all the motions. It's almost as if you make your, your checklist on what it means to be haunted by watching your favorite show. You take the common denominators and then whenever you go into investigate, now they thoroughly believe that they're going through this experience. And indeed they are, they're going through it in their mind. You know, they're, they are making this up as they go along. Now, these people are not crazy. Uh, these people still need us to be there to walk them through it. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not working as a paranormal investigator. You're working as some sort of clinical psychologist, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, everything you say just hits home for me. And it's like, you know, uh, just reminiscing on the last two years for my team here in San Diego. Uh, more so in the last two years than previous years, we've probably an influx of, I would say the emails that come through are, I can't get my thoughts together tonight. I don't know what's wrong with me. Two wires aren't connecting. Oh my gosh. But anyways, um, the emails that we receive for case requests, now primarily private residence cases, mm. I would say the majority of those are from people who really do believe that they have some sort of demonic or malevolent force in their home. Now, this is interesting to me because prior, I would say in the last two years, but before that, not so much. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an example. Okay. You know, society is heavily focused on all of this stuff and the negative and the demonic and the malevolent. And that's, that's messing with people's mm -hmm. brains. Mm -hmm. it, is. You know? it really is. It really is. Well, um, there's also, um, and we'll have to get back. This is going to get off track a little bit, but we'll get back around. I promise. One of the things that I like to look at whenever we're studying the realm of the paranormal is what actually is um, the thing at the time. You know, what is, what is in style, basically. So we had, um, you know, the, we, we had the idea of the demonic. Um, but if we would go back a few years ago, and although these are not truly, you know, paranormal creatures that people are witnessing, uh, but there was that craze of the walking dead out there, you know, the craze of the zombies. And yes. we the craze of the zombies uh -huh. back in the 70s as well, too. And there's a, if we really look at this stuff, we can actually um, 
kind of decipher what what our cultural in general was like. So whenever you had things like The Walking Dead, um, it was a very nihilistic culture. Um, people were worried about things were going nowhere. You know, we were hitting a peak and we were afraid that, you know, there was nothing else out there. Everything was going to kind of break down, uh, degrading of society. What's going to happen now is that with this all this UFO stuff going out there, and because we're such a high-tech culture, I think we're going to see an, an influx of UFO reports coming through. I think we're yes. going to see more of that connection between Bigfoot and the UFOs. I think we're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff uh, tied together as well. Um, if we remember, you know, 20-some years ago, 30-some years ago, I guess, going back now, when Chupacabras started to make their, their way around, and that had so much to do with an influx of, of, of immigration because this was a Central American cryptid, you know, and we can actually trace the folklore and the legend building of that creature from a porcupine type of space alien looking creature. Now it has become a blue dog you know in the texas area um because that initial um belief has been corroded and magnified and detracted from in this melting pot that we have here and that's really what goes on so it's really cool to look at the world of the supernatural and the cryptozoological from a perspective about the way society is projecting itself onto them as well too but that's yeah, very well said yeah, absolutely but, but that's the thing i think that right now there is still this idea that you know life is is um we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, even though we've had a change in presidents Things still are not to the point that we can say, oh, we are in good hands here. You know, I don't think anybody is safe. So things are still very ambiguous right now. So now we're looking at something to help us out or some sort of a revelation to come from beyond. And now we see all these kind of influx, like I said, of the UFOs coming through. And maybe we're, we're looking for a salvation from beyond to help us out here. Um, I was reading a report uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, the, in the, um, the memos that were declassified. And one of the gentlemen that was flying the, uh, the uh, plane, he said that the, 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 the craft was able to uh, um, lock off of his uh, his um, military guidance system, so he wouldn't be able to fire his weapons at it, at it. So, if you think about that now, we can actually build upon that and start saying that this is an anti-war type of movement. You know, we can make these things into anything that we want to make them at this point, and I think that that's what's going to happen. I, I really do. But it's, it's great because. Again, we're getting off track here a little bit, but we really can examine the way society is working by seeing what they believe in from a supernatural level. That makes sense. And, you know, I, something f that's important to me is, uh, let's say 10 years ago, the craze was this. 10 years from now, there's going to be a different craze. Right. It, you, you don't want to forget the past necessarily. You know, mm -hmm. if you, you want to keep everything kind of on the same plate, because you may have an experience 10 years from now that may validate something from the 1980s and then the dots connect. That's right. Just had to, just had to say that. Yeah, and it is all about connecting the dots. Um, the world of the paranormal uh, is almost like you are put into a room and there is a, a crossword puzzle out on the table and somebody dumps like five or six other puzzles out on the table and says, okay, put that together so you can get a clear picture, you know? Exactly. I, I use that analogy yeah. too, like, it's like a big undone puzzle and trying to put pieces of the puzzle together. That's but right. I find it interesting that you uh, investigate kind of a wide spectrum. So you investigate the cryptids, you investigate Bigfoot as well as the uh, ghosts and hauntings. Mm -hmm. For someone that's just, I guess, getting into the field of the paranormal, what are some similarities and differences between, I guess, cryptid research and just uh, general like ghost and hauntings the ghost and hauntings arena ghost research yeah let's say. Uh, and that is a good question as well too um we we have to rely the similarities is that we have to rely on uh the written record um yeah. ghosts are bookmarks in history they they truly are they mm -hmm. they occupy a particular time and space and they are allowing us into their 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 past, you know, their, their lives that once lived. Um, and and Bigfoot and all these other cryptids are also the same. They have a tradition and they have a history as well too. And by better understanding this milieu in which they've evolved from, the 
better we can understand them on their terms. So many times we go out there and we investigate ghosts or we investigate cryptids on our terms, and that never works out. Nobody's going to find anything. Nobody's going to come to any conclusions. We have to allow the world around us to operate the way it's always been operating, and we're just taking a glimpse into what has been going on with or without us there. That makes sense. So with that, where do you see, as of right now, where do you see the, I guess, let's the entire umbrella of paranormal research, where do you see it headed? Um, In your opinion, I like to ask people that, you yeah. know, are, are, are knowledgeable about the field. I like to ask this question because um, it's I think, something I think about a lot. Well, sure. And I think you probably will agree that it's going to become much more um, scientifically focused. I don't think there's going to be that many people out there anymore with, you know, cheap cameras. I mean, look, I go out in the woods sometimes with people that have four or $5,000 worth of equipment on them. You know, they're out there to capture and collect evidence. Um, I think we're going to see uh, methodical collecting. I think we're going to see the scientific method being used when we go out there on investigations of all different kinds um, because people are not just ghost hunting anymore. This is no longer a hobby. For a lot of people, this is an obsession. And that obsession is never going to be realized. There's never going to be a cure for that obsession until there is some sort of definitive conclusion. That to me is sad in a way, though, because I think for and I'm speaking for myself personally, the beauty of the field lies in its ability to be vague and mysterious. I mean, of course, I want answers like everyone else, but I'm okay if I don't get them, so Mm -hmm. to speak. So if someone that goes out and can't find an objective piece of data, if you will, or some sort of substantial piece of evidence I don't want that that person to be deterred from continuing the research because that's, that's, that's yeah. just kind of my thought. Um, well, yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, we are always going to be on the quest for definitive conclusions. Okay. But just because we're on the quest doesn't mean we're ever going to obtain that. Um, right. Human beings need to be put in their place. They need to understand that there is no way we can know everything that there is to know out there. And unless yeah. a mystery exists, we will never have that ultimate hubris that will make us collapse into something degenerative. As long as we're chasing something that's beyond ourselves, we'll always be put on our place. That, you know, that's that gets me thinking because I think that and I think you're addressing the, the, the ego that we all have as humans and everything as well. You know, people, if we expect or think that we know everything about something, that's going to be a deterrent. So if we were to change our thinking and to kind of just buckle down a little bit, you know, I think there will be more experiences. I think people are going to be humbled, so to speak. So that yeah. kind of does make sense. Yeah. So scientific method. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, that's, that's I, I think the scientific method is, but you're also saying though too, and I think there is something to be said about not relying on science either. Um, I firmly believe, and this is almost a, a, a religious type of uh, an observation, um, and we touched a little bit on this last time. I firmly believe that this whole universe around us puts out a vibrational frequency. I think a lot of, I think it has been at least, if if not wholly proven, it's been at least suggested on a scientific level that what I'm talking about is, is probably plausible that there is this kind of vibrational frequency that the whole universe is, is, is giving off. Okay. Um, You know, and, and I think, you know, people in the Middle Ages talked about the music of the spheres that, you know, the stars and the planets uh, put all, all, all this kind of vibrational sounds. But I think that everything is connected by frequency and vibration and by electricity. And there is that incredible union among all living things and even some non-living things that we are one and the same. OK, now that being said, we as humanity have stepped outside of that vibrational frequency. It has not left us. We have left it. Um, And I think that one of the ways to simply tune back into that is to admit that we left that frequency and just go out into the natural world and allow that frequency to, to to come in tune with that frequency once again. 
That's kind of what I was touching upon earlier. And I was going to ask you about the whole metaphysical realm, because for me personally, and I know for a lot of other people, blending and some people cringe at the word science in this field. You know, I, I, I get the pros and cons of that, but I'm going to use the word science for the sake of you know our discussion. Blending science, if you will, blend, blending um, objection or objective data with subjective, what I call subjective data, which is our intuition and what our psychic senses are telling us. I think when you blend that, it lends to a more beautiful, I guess, union than just relying on one or the other. Because, yes. you know, that frequency is not necessarily going to be detected by scientific gadgets. It's going to only be it's some of it in, in the, I guess, the co- world of collective consciousness, that frequency mm-hmm. is going to fit more in with you know, our, the, our human, I guess, frequencies that we put out. So Right, right. But I mean, look, you do see this, especially in, in, in Eastern philosophies and Eastern medicines, like the idea of alignment of chakras, you know, the idea that this has always been there with us for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden we decided to, to move away from it. That was a decision. That was a conscious decision to move away from this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I think you'll agree that we are metaphysical creatures bound in a biological body, right? I mean, that, that is the thing. Um, one of the, uh, of the uh, realms of the paranormal that I really have no problem with is the existence of ghosts. I, I think that the most human beings, if you come to it, will say, well, no matter what the religious beliefs are or what the scientific beliefs are, is they would say, yeah, I, I have no problem accepting that. Um, I think that we've all had enough experiences to know that there is something beyond that line between life and death, okay? And I'm talking about just us. Look, we can go back over 200,000 years ago and find out that the the Neanderthal actually buried their dead with, with grave goods because they believed, I mean, so, so what is causing that? What is causing a species of, of human to understand just by observation from the natural world that something lies beyond this place, you know? And whenever you look at the graves of, of, of the great peoples, uh, especially the Celtic people, whenever they have these grave chambers uh, uh, situated to look like mounds, and then they have openings to align to certain sun spot, you know, solstices or equinoxes, to me, that tells me that even in death, there is the idea of this ultimate union with the world and the universe around them, you know. Um, and I think that we are hardwired to believe in that for some reason. Um, because, you know, there's cultures around the world. You can look at cultures from any continent uh, and they would suggest the same thing, at least some level of their existence. Um, I think that's always been with us. That's our own intuition that you talked about. But we've neglected to um, really accept that intuition uh, because it seems superstitious or archaic. But I really think in order to get to the bottom of this, we have to return to that almost that innocence from once we came. Oh, I, th- that's absolutely. I can't agree more. You actually wrote a book on examining various cultures and religious beliefs on 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 death and the afterlife, right? I did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the um, uh, uh, harmonics of humanity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you examined uh, all kinds of different cultures and I guess religious beliefs on on uh, death and the afterlife. What are some similarities and differences that you've found amongst all these different cultures? Um, One of the most amazing things that I found is not so much how the afterlife affects us in death, because whatever happens to us is going to happen to us, but how much it affects us in life. The idea that we can forgive and the idea, look, that we can can move on from things that have wronged us. Um, I think that is really one of the most fundamental things for me as a believer in, in a deity and believer in the divine is that we have that within ourselves to say, no matter what kind of harm has been done against me, I'm, 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 I'm big enough to say I, I can let it go and I forgive. 
That's how oh, that's so interesting because it is true. Like mm. you have to look at how it affects us in life. Right. That's right. You know, that's a really good way of looking at it actually. Yes. Um, there was, um, I worked uh, for most of my adult life. I worked in counseling of some kinds, uh, sometimes with uh, adolescents, sometimes with little children, sometimes with families, but I worked in uh, geriatric counseling for a few years and um, I remember working with a hospice uh, with one lady um, that was very near death. Um, and she was treated not too kindly by her husband in life. You know, he was one of these guys that, you know, kind of cheated on her, um, really didn't treat her the best. And um, she knew that she was dying and she took everything on her own terms. And one of the things that she did was have her husband come into the room so she could forgive him, you know. Oh, wow. And and that, you know, you could understand how that kind of burden to have that tossed off of your shoulders in the last couple of days of your life. And the other thing about this as well, too, that unless these kind of wrongs are forgiven, they will always have a power over us. Right. The only way they do not have a power over us anymore is is if we accept them and then we allow them to go away. That's so well said. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking about that woman. So she actually volunteered Mm -hmm. to have her husband come in. That's that says a lot. Well, it says a lot. Yeah. That says a lot about the type of of person she was and is. Do you know how the husband responded to that? Well, in tears. I think that that is the whole thing. So Um, it healed him, too. It was healing for him as well. Absolutely. Which is is the point here. Yep. Getting getting back to the idea of the vibration. At that point, maybe the first time in their entire marriage, they were in union in that vibrational unity, that harmony, you know, and that's what affected them so much. Uh, so we really have to look at everybody like that, um, that we are all interconnected and anything that I do wrong to another person is going to be, it's like throwing a pebble out into the water. There's going to be that ripple and it's going to affect everything else around us. Exactly. Yeah. I use that analogy <laughs> yeah. kind of on the same wavelength here, but that's so interesting about that story because it took that individual cl- being close to death mm-hmm. to almost you know, uh, I guess heal right. the two of them, which is just sure. phenomenal to me. Exactly. exactly. You, know, you hear of, uh, you know, you go into the spirit world. I mean, some people choose to stay behind in the earthbound realm as, as we theorize, mm-hmm. uh, others will evolve more, I guess, or higher into the different stages of the spirit realm, but there's a lot of teaching that goes on with that and a lot of evolution. So it mm-hmm. sounds like she was already starting that, just on the brink of death which yes is, absolutely absolutely so intriguing i actually got i have chills listening to that <laughs> yeah. i wanted uh um, really, really it touches me very much though too thinking it about does it, yeah it does i have like chills like on my body yeah. it's those are the types of stories that are so beautiful and i wish mm. there were more of them or people would elect to share more of these types of stories than yes, yes. just all the scary and negative and all that because there's yeah. a lot of beauty a lot of beauty out there. Well, and that's what I did in my book as well, too. Um, I tried to pull in some of these these stories that I had heard, some of these experiences mm-hmm. that I've had, and then look at cultures from around the world and how similar all the religions are. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter what we're talking about, all the religions are very, very similar whenever it gets down to it. And instead of arguing about whose God is better, let us just go out there and accept that what, what this God wants us to do, you know? That's yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, And then if, if people could learn to take that or this type of concept and Mm -hmm. apply it to paranormal research, I think we would be a lot further along than we are. We would be miles and miles and miles. That's right. That's right. We are, but hopefully, you know, we'll get to that day, but Mm -hmm. we have about 15 minutes left in the show. Time goes by fast. I wanted to talk a little bit about folklore Mm -hmm. because I find, you know, folklore and the paranormal i think share a lot of similarities Mm -hmm. so how i mean in your opinion um being a folklorist if you will how do you apply that to paranormal research and or i guess what are the benefits of applying that to paranormal research 
Well, we, we can find a continuity, okay, especially whenever we're talking about the world of cryptids or, or ghosts even come out to play as well, too. So when we talk about folklore, I always like to look at the word tradition, which is, you know, from the Latin, and it literally means to pass down. It's as if I have something and I pass it down and that person passes it down as well, too. Um, look, that's what happened to me. When it, we're, we're bringing this show full circle, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah. my, my mother had this great, uh, this great open mind for the things that were paranormal and, and, and things that go bump in the night. And she passed that on to me. Now I'm passing it on to my children as well, too, uh, just, just to stay wide eyed and wonder at the things around us, you know. Um, and whenever we look at cultures like the indigenous peoples of, the, of, of North America or really any culture around the world and find out how these creatures, these beings, how religion influenced them in that continuity, you know, in that particular time and space and seeing how it it, it influences us to this day. That's what really means so much to me to think that, you know, this, this creature that we call Bigfoot has been with us since, you know, since the Epic of Gilgamesh was written or the idea of, of something beyond our knowledge has been out there since the very first time we decided to tell a story. Um, there's always something beyond that campfire glow. And there's always something outside of our window, outside of these electric lights. There's always going to be something outside there just evading our grasp, living in the periphery. And as I said at the beginning, we need that because without that, then we have lost that part of our humanity that I love so much. And that is that sense of wonder and, and, and bewilderment. Yeah, that's oh my gosh. I mean, you're so eloquent with the way you explain things. Like it's it, you're you're the type of person I could just listen. You know, you just talk so well about all of this. It's great. It's very easy to listen to. Do you have a favorite? Well, I mean, you probably have many, but a favorite folklore story that kind of deals with the paranormal at all that you want to share? Wow, that that well, I know there's probably many of them. Well, right? There, there are a lot of them, <laughs> and I was thinking because um, I, I I'm going to be doing um, a couple of talks here within the next uh, the next month. I'm going to be doing a talk on fairies, which I really oh. really love fairies so much uh, because there is been, and we talk about that continuity. I mean, we can look all around the world, um, but the idea that there is some sort of intelligent elemental energy that's out there um, that you know it, whether it's the personification in the human mind of natural forces or there's something else out there that is part of our universal folklore um you know carl Jung called this the deep grammar of who we are and so Mm -hmm. folklore is that stuff that kind of transcends anybody you know the names may change but what it's trying to teach us is is in essence um universal okay so it's hard for me just to pinpoint one thing, um, but I would say that 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 without folklore and without the idea of tradition and and this past thoughts that we so so heavily rely on, we wouldn't be here today. Our civilization wouldn't be here today. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, even with folklore too, you have uh, from generation to generation to generation the same sorts of stories, but maybe retold in different ways or new experiences. So it kind of parallels almost historical research in a way where, you know, you have all these annals of historical research, but maybe you can find a little bit of more information in this document versus this document. So it's just, it's compiled information year after year after year. And it's important to our, our field of study. But I mean, you could go back and you can see the very rustic uh, traditions of people that believed in fairies. And then by the time we get to the Renaissance, people taking those beliefs and institutionalizing them in the world of alchemy and without alchemy, which led almost directly to pharmaceuticals and the idea of how medicines work, you know, so it all builds upon us. So what what I like, even with the idea of law, you know, a lot of our idea of where law comes from is it was handed down by the gods, you know, and we go through this great Western tradition where places like Greece and Rome have sifted all these things, all, all this, all the chaff off, if you will, and have given us to what we have to this very day. So everything that we have is part of a tradition um, it's part, you know, we're, we're standing on the, on the shoulders of giants. We are not the giants. We are these little bitty creatures that are hanging on at the very end uh, to see what other people's uh, people have said. But without, we are, we are based upon tradition and folklore. Without that, we wouldn't be who we are. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. So about 10 minutes left in the show. I wanted to give you some time to talk about your books okay. because you have many of them. I do. I do. I, amazing. I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of prolific. Um, so my, my the first book that I wrote was on mermaids uh, because my, my daughter, well, in a series. The first book that I wrote was called Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, and that deals primarily with my research here in Western Pennsylvania. So it's about about 30 years worth of my research that I, that I put into this book talking about Bigfoot and aliens and, and, and werewolves and all this other kind of great stuff. And um, I was doing some research on this, and my daughter was very much into, into uh, mermaids at the time, and she said, if you can write all that crap about Bigfoot, do you think you could write a book about mermaids? <laughs> I said, well, let me try. And I, I did about a, a week's worth of, uh, of research. And I thought, this is pretty cool. Uh, so then I wrote a book on mermaids. Um, and then I, I was one of those people that I really, the first book was so, took so much toll on me that I really did not want to do it again. It's a very lonely job, um, especially whenever you have other responsibilities. You know, I was raising a family. I was going through a divorce whenever I was doing all this stuff. So it was very difficult for me just to get one book done. And then um, whenever I wrote the book for my daughter um, on mermaids, I thought, well, there's so many more questions out there that I want to explore. So then I wrote a book about, you know, werewolves and and, and Bigfoot and, and vampires and all this other stuff, ghosts and, and everything. Um, because every time I end a book, there are more questions that are being asked. Exactly. And, yeah. Yes. And, and the other thing is how, how much they're tied together. I could write a book about mermaids and find information about ghosts, you know, because yeah. they're all tied together. So I had this huge library of information, uh, uh, you know, just piled up all over the place. And I thought, well, I'll just start sifting through this. So after the first couple of books, the other books came out, out rather easy. Uh, because I had so much of the research done on the previous books. But, uh, yeah, it's just something that interests me. Um, you know, I, I also write poetry and other things, and and I would love to be famous for, for that kind of stuff as well, too. Um, but right now, I'll, I'll, I'll settle with the, with the unexplained. That's awesome, though. I You know, I love talking to, to fellow authors, and writing – Writing a book takes a lot of effort. I mean, it's it, people think, oh, okay, maybe the actual writing time might be two months or three months, but sometimes it takes, you know, three, four years to compile yeah. all that information, especially with, yeah. you know, your your types of subjects. So, yeah, yeah I remember um, rather fondly. I remember this. I was sitting there typing one time, and I had uh, two little two of my little ones, and they were both in diapers, as a matter of fact. Uh, sitting on my lap as I was trying to type one of the books. So I went through a lot of trials and tribulations getting to where I am today. Um, and but, but I am proud of my accomplishments because I, I, I really am a fan of this field. And I wanted to add something to the field that was unique and worthwhile. And I think if we look at all this stuff from a different perspective, that only adds to things becoming much more lucid and much more clear. Absolutely. And I think, too, you know, we're all out in the field and we all have different opinions and maybe different styles and different uh, approaches to our methodology. But, uh, you know, just accept one another. You know, if you disagree with someone, that's fine. You know, I think there we need to kind of just come together more than, you know, yep. stop all the all the judgment, all of that. But this hour has flown by. You mentioned that you have a couple of talks coming up. So I do, yeah. yeah, talk about those. Talk about what, you know, what's going on next for you. Presentations, books. Right. Yeah. Well, if you weren't, yeah. in, if you weren't in San Diego, you're still in San Diego, correct? I'm, yeah. I'm in San Diego. Yeah. 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 See, this is all going to be in Western Pennsylvania. So I'm going to be at uh, Hillview Manor, which is in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's one of these iconic places. So I'll be talking about fairies there on, uh, on July the 9th. And this will be the first presentation I've ever given off of my book, which was written during right after COVID, it came out. So oh, it's never been presented before. So yeah, I'm excited about that. And then uh, two weeks uh, from the day, I'll be back at Hillview Manor on the day of the full moon, which I believe is the 23rd. And I'll be doing a talk about Bigfoot. And then later in the evening, I'll be talking about werewolves. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, Pennsylvania, I have never been, I've been to the East coast many mm-hmm. times, but there's something about Pennsylvania. There's this actual, uh, cause I'm into ASMR and there's this YouTuber, ephemeral rift is his channel name and he lives out in Pennsylvania. And so he does these nature walks. Oh, yes. And so I've been able to see a lot of the, the woodlands out in Pennsylvania through his videos. And there's just something very striking about Pennsylvania. It, it attracts mm-hmm. me. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> If yeah. I move out there one day, but it's well, just, it's really beautiful. Well, it is beautiful. And the other thing when we talked about folklore, the other thing that's so cool about Pennsylvania is that we were um, a state that founded by Quakers and we yeah. were a lot of religious freedoms like no other state really had. So we yeah. had, we had uh, this, this melting pot of different religions and we had the, uh, the, uh, the, the Dutch coming in and, you know, so then we have all this kind of stuff going. So the idea of spirits and, and things that are creepy like that was brought over with people as well and so they were able to project it onto the land and then all the things that happen around here are creepy that have indigenous uh, origins as well too it all kind of makes sense and forms it does a great yeah it to totally does in. yeah when you're saying that i'm like yeah that's probably what's attracting me to pennsylvania but that's it's just right. it's so it's so beautiful out there it's you know i just i'm i live 10 minutes from the beach but i would take woodlands over the beach any day yeah. so you know maybe one of these days i'll head out in that direction, but uh, it's been a pleasure having you on tonight. It. Yeah. It, for having me on. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have a lot of, you know, wealth of knowledge, very eloquent in the way you explain things. So thank you so much. Uh, I forgot to ask though, where can people find your books? I'm assuming at all the online retail outlets. Everything right? is available on Amazon. Everything. Yeah, I don't care sure. what you're looking for. I mean, look, <laughs> if you want a hat, you know, you can order anything at all. So I'm <laughs> starting that shopping cart you might as well throw one of my books in there as well too exactly there you go right. yeah amazon pretty much has everything but okay. oh my gosh thank you so much for coming well, on I, appreciate it. I can't wait to talk with you again yeah we'll definitely plan this again for the future have a wonderful fourth of july with your family stay safe out there enjoy your talks and oh, okay. uh well, uh, yeah, we'll do this again someday because there's a lot more. I, w- I have like a list of other questions I would like to ask you. But, but Anytime, I'll be here. Part one, we'll do part two. So, but anyways, Actually, part three will be part three. It, well, oh, yeah, because Haunted Voices now. Yeah. yeah, it will be part three. You're right. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. We'll have a safe holiday right. and we'll talk soon. So there you have it, folks. That was Ronald Murphy, paranormal investigator folklorist and very prolific author he's always very engaging to talk with next week i will have on brandon alvis of the second reboot of ghost hunters excuse me and the american paranormal research association in which is based out of la so i want to thank all my viewers tonight for tuning in i hope everyone has a wonderful and safe fourth of july i cannot believe it's already july One last thought, as I always say here at the Afterlife Chronicles, we are bridging the gap between mortality and the afterlife one experience at a time. See you later, guys. Good night.